I'm ready. You ready? Yes. So I'm, I'm going to make some assumptions because there's been a pattern uh, at the Art of Mentoring for a few years now. Um, I, I'm assuming that we followed the, the usual pattern so that I can just speak to this. You can. Okay. Um, so there's, there's a whole thing that's going on behind the scenes, you know, that um, if you had any idea how hard these people work before, during, and after each day, and before, during, but not really after an art of mentoring, because people are toasted. I mean, the, the staff is completely fried by the end of the art of mentoring. Um, and uh, because they, they're doing a lot of things to make it look like nothing's happening. They're going way out of their way to create an experience for you that is designed to seem like nothing's going on. And one of my favorite pieces of feedback around that, is there really something going on or are we just sitting in a wet field? <laughs> you know? Um, yeah. And, and yeah, is this really a journey? Yeah, is there really something happening here? You know, the, is there any structure behind this thing? Um, or, or are we just sitting in a soggy wet field? And you know what? That's the li question of life anyway, isn't it? Because, you know, <laughs> you'll, you'll sort of just make it what it is or you won't, you know? Uh, it's both of those things for sure. So, um, knowing that there's something behind it, I don't know if that helps or not. And I, the, the, the temptation is always to try to overload you with details on this day. We call this the unveiling because what, what we're going to do is kind of show you some of the patterns that we're running in the background. Okay? But there's so many hundreds of possible ways in which that un unfolded here. And it was up to each and every staff person's creativity and consensus process that they were in. We have no idea what actually transpired. We just know what the playbook suggests, but it does not tell us what to do. So um, I will give you some insights into a pattern. But that staff member dressed up as the deer did do exactly what we asked. <laughs> <laughs> It was Connor. You <laughs> know, the curly horn. <laughs> oh, great. Okay, so um, the other thing I wanted to say is that um, there's a certain intentionality around things that uh, is really powerful and unmysterious, really, actually. Uh, and one of the things over the years that that uh, we learned was that the, the archetypal framework behind the scenes, you know, the eight shields, actually has power beyond our understanding. And uh, it really doesn't matter who you're talking to, the most experienced people who run art of mentoring or who use it in their communities, none of us have any explanation for why it works. Um, we, we have our ideas and we have our nights where we get excited and go riffing on these conversations where we feel like we know what we're talking about. <laughs> but that quickly fades when you wake up the next morning, you can't even remember what you were talking about. So there's a certain mystery to what's happening also that we have no control over. Um, and it, I believe it has to do with the fact that we as human beings seem to be ergonomically designed to have a certain response on a subconscious level to certain archetypal energies being played out in a group. Does that make sense? That's been co-opted and utilized in lots of different ways over the world for lots of different purposes. Some of them uh, really fun and funny, others not so good. Um, but the bottom line is there's a ceremonial component going on behind the scenes that has no religious connection. You know, I would, I would, I would say that uh, the ceremonial component of the Eight Shields uh, is profound um, in the way that all ceremony can be, except it has no belief system. It doesn't have a, a, a dogma attached to it, all right? Because it's sort of like trying to figure out the dogma of grabbing with your hand because your hand is designed to grab. There's no need to have a belief system around it. You know, how many, how many of you guys have really deeply contemplated the meaning of being able to grab and actually, like, you know, had existential dilemmas over it? You know what I mean? It's so, it's so primary and basic, you know, it's just... We can grab, because somewhere in our ancestry, grabbing was necessary. You understand what I mean? Maybe you don't. I mean, I, I think the art of mentoring is, is a celebration of all that we were designed for, but haven't been met there in a long time. That's that again. That's a good sign. Yeah. Okay? It's, it's, a, it's a celebration 
of all that the human being was designed to receive in the life experience, but we haven't had that opportunity in a long, long time. We're designed for something. My favorite explanation of it was Bill Hill from, from Scotland, and I don't remember exactly where Bill is from in Scotland. I believe it might be Glasgow, but um, he worked for uh, Adobe, the font company, and became a font expert. And he started on the streets as a street musician, and he came from a really poor background. And, and then he discovered like a meditation process and practice, and um, he and his wife Tanya, um, who's an incredible artist, sort of lived this life that was really uh, quite celebratory of nature and the connection to nature. But Bill ended up in the font business, and then he was recruited to Microsoft. They came over and got him, and then they brought him to the U.S., and I met him there in Washington State. And um, he dropped his daughter off in the morning and then left, and then would come back and pick her up in the evening. And that was how we interacted for a while, until one day he drove her to one of our workshops in his open Jeep with no roof on it. He dropped her off, and then it started to pour down rain, like buckets. So he realized that he wasn't really meant to drive away this time, and so he actually stayed and listened. And he was really deeply touched by something that was said during that workshop. And he was right in the middle of researching fonts, F-O-N-T-S. And he said to us, uh, not during that workshop, but later, he said that the job of a good font is to disappear. You know? He said, if, if you pick up a book and start reading a book and you become conscious of the fonts, we've already lost. Right? You shouldn't even know there is such a thing as a font. You should pick up the book, enter into the experience, and find yourself slipping through that book like a downhill sled ride. You know, the first few pages will be a bit as your brain starts to gear up. But once you engage, the words disappear, the pages disappear, and you go on a visual mental journey that has smells and tastes and emotions and feelings, and you'll even sweat, he said. You know, you'll notice your own smells from your body as <laughs> you get drawn into the story so deeply, and you'll come popping out the back end of the book. He says, that's a good font. <laughs> right? And uh, <laughs> he actually did research on something called the magic of reading. His paper, which he presented all over the world, was the magic of reading. And he said, his, my favorite line that came out of that was, he stands in front of the Microsoft community, all these high-tech people from all over the world who are absolutely brilliant, right? He's just talking to this massive audience, and he says, how many of you would run the wrong operating system on your hardware? And, of course, they all just kind of laugh. Right? He says, but that's exactly what we're doing. You know? And he's talking about the human being. He says, this being was designed for a very specific interaction with the world. And we would never think, ever think, we'd, we'd let, you guys all laugh at how ridiculous it is that we run the wrong operating system on the hardware that it wasn't designed for. But that's exactly what we do as human beings in this modern life. You know, we're running the wrong... Uh, software and operating system on this hardware. This hardware was designed for something. You know, and he, he put that out there in such a strong way, and, and I, I sat and listened to that, that lecture over and over and over again, and it was just so completely in agreement. You know, the art of mentoring is about understanding the operating system for the hardware that we were given. It's that basic. It's that ergonomic. It's right back to the grabbing because you're designed to grab. Okay? which is completely unsatisfying for those of you who are looking for some philosophical or conceptual framework to grab and shake. You know, you can throw it down and fight with it and wrestle it with it all you want. It's, you're not going to find it. There was a, an anthropologist who was working with the, the Kalahari Bushmen, um, and he was convinced that they were hiding their worldview from him. He was convinced of it. So he was trying to get them to understand that he wanted to know what their sort of religious beliefs were about the universe. He wanted to understand what they understood and what they knew. <clears throat> and he asked them so many different ways, and they just looked at him blankly, like they just didn't understand what he was saying. So he started telling them stories and explaining something, and, and one of them said, 
oh, I think I know what you're after now. So after you know, weeks and months of getting to know these people and building relationships, he finally gets one of them to say, oh, I think I know what you mean. So he says, well, okay, tell me, you know, what is your worldview? You know? So they, this man sits and explains this beautiful, cohesive worldview to this guy. You know? It's a whole framework and a story, and it all fits together in like this cosmological thing, right? So he's like, oh, great, you got it, you nailed it, you know? And he says, but, but please come back this afternoon and ask me again because it will change. And, and as, you know, this afternoon I probably won't have that same framework. I'll have an entirely different one. And then tomorrow, ask me in the morning again because I'm sure it will be different, you know. And the guy got so frustrated because what he really wanted to know was that they were hanging on to some belief structure just like he was. You know, but they don't hang on to anything because it means nothing to hang on to something like that. Why would you hang on to something like that? It's completely useless. In, in their world, it has no value whatsoever, which he really could not get his mind around, right? So why do I talk about those people? What is how, it has nothing to do with you at all, does it? We're not in the Kalahari. We've got plenty of water, don't we? <laughs> We're not having a water shortage right now. At least my shoes believe so, on the way over here. Why would I tell you about the Kalahari Bushmen? How is that relevant? Yes? They're an example of a kind of pure culture which is quickly disappearing, so it won't be, won't be there for long. What else? What else do the Kalahari Bushmen have to teach us? Who are they? Yes? Yeah, thank you. They've got the same hardware as we do. What else? Let's, let's go on that, yeah? They're, they were, and especially in the time of that story I just told you, they were living directly off the land. There's nothing in between. Yeah? Strongly connected to their ancestry, for sure. <clears throat> yeah? They're watching the land change constantly. They're watching the nature. Yeah, the you're saying... Okay, change. you're saying they're watching the land change constantly. But they're more than watching it, right? They're, it's more like a fish in the water of change constant, right? They're not, they're not watching... Well, I'll, I'll give you some more examples in a minute. They're, they're so fully involved in the sensory experience of the land changing constantly. There's nothing between them and that experience. The change is happening, which is them. They are the change that's constantly happening. Come on, there's, there's something even more crucial here. Yes? They live in a, not only a dynamic, but also an egalitarian and classless society. Yes. In which a fixed worldview, which is sustained and reinforced by some kind of principle <coughs> is just, well, thank goodness for them, at least at that stage, was not on the agenda. Yeah. Which is basically destroyed by the rest of the world. Right, very good. <coughs> well said. So that's a good description of, of the complexity that we've made of life, not them, that we've made, right? And there's layers and, and all this kind of class stuff and politics and all kinds of weird things that have, that have ar ar arose, risen out of all of this. But there's something even more crucial to this story that I'm, I'm digging for. Yes? They've remained fully in their heart and in love with nature. They, they are fully in their heart and in love with nature. I would agree with that. Yeah? They're living in connection and unity. Connection and no unity. Separation. No separation. Good. These are, all, these are all true statements. There's something even more crucial to this story from a historical standpoint. We originated there. Yes. We. Species. We are descended from the same people they are. Our ancestors were there in that very place. Bushmen who were there are in such unity with the land that there's this extraordinary uh, back and forth uh, relationship between the people and the land there that is, is almost mystifying. Right? It's like you cannot get your head around what's going on there because it's not happening in the head. And they're not doing it in the head either. They're just, they're fully in their being. And, and their minds are used for humor. They use their brains to tell stories and to have fun with each other and to joke and to laugh. And the expression of their consciousness that they most revere is humor. Right? So if you're with them, you're, you're, you're looking back at something and you're, and you're thinking to yourself, what does this mean and why is this relevant? If I could capture the essence of what the Bushmen have going on in a bottle and I could distribute it out without you knowing and get you to swim in it for a couple of days, it would be really healing for you. And we would call it the art of mentoring. And what it would be doing is going underneath your consciousness 
and putting the software in and the operating system in that you were designed to receive, and magic would occur from that exactly because it was working with your design. Like a good font, you'll go seamlessly into experience and pop out the back end. Right? It'll, it'll disappear if it's done well. Are you with me on that now? You see why I used that example? Um, so, what is the operating system designed for? And, and, and after this, I will lay some framework down. What is the, the operating system designed for? It seems to be designed for some very primary things. It's designed, number one, for you to have a full sensory experience. You know, these are the things that are operating in the background the entire time I'm speaking from here on. So, I'll always defer to this list that I'm giving to you right now as I speak. But, number one, the, the entire experience is designed to encourage, enhance, celebrate, and feed and re-stimulate a, a dynamic sensory experience. All your senses. But we have no control over your habits and patterns up to this point. So if you've been a very visual person up to this point, um, we can't fully save, save you from that experience. Because you have like, if you're 40, you have 40 years of momentum behind it. 40 years of habit is hard to break. Right? So, but you're designed you are designed to have a full dynamic sensory system. So the person who came up with the idea that there's visual learners and there's kinesthetic learners was really separating us unnecessarily. You're all kinesthetic learners. You're all visual learners. You're all olfactory learners, which isn't one of the learners, by the way. You know what I mean? It's not one of the things that they list. But you're designed to have all your senses fully stimulated and engaged meaningfully. Meaningful engagement with all senses is the second layer. Meaningful engagement with all senses, which means that you're not just hearing a sound, you're hearing a sound in a highly dimensional context that has meaning. Can I give you an example? When I ask the Bushman women a question, five of them answer me at the same time. They're all looking at me and they're all talking to me at the exact same time in their language and nothing wrong with that. None, none of them feel like the other one's stepping on them. They don't feel like they're being rude because they're completely capable of understanding five conversations coming at them at the same time. So when they get together and talk, they all talk at once. And you would think that it's total chaos, but they're actually tracking each other's conversations brilliantly because they are using their full dynamic capacity as auditory people. You want my favorite example, I don't know, Phil, if you were here for this week or if this was when, you weren't with Robin Bliss Wagner, were you? Robin Bliss Wagner? No, you weren't there for that. You were with Anna Breitenbach. Okay, so here's, here's this old Bushman named Guta, okay? He's bent over and he's doing something over here and he's working and the women are talking and the translator's translating and there's someone over here talking to them. And so Robin Bliss Wagner's over here and he's watching Guta and he's watching me and I'm standing here watching this. <coughs> And there's something happening over here, and there's a little bird alarm going off in the bush. Maybe 30 feet back behind over here, okay? So, Guta's over here doing this, and then Robin says, do you hear that to me in English? <clears throat> and I say, yeah. And uh, we have to wait for the translation to, to finish. So this, the bird alarm stops. Guta's really busy like this. He's talking in his language. And Robin says to the translator, Franz, can you please ask... Guta, what kind of bird alarm is going on behind him? And Guta hears it and he just starts speaking. He says, that was a mongoose. You know, and he just continues, right? Doesn't even break stride. He was tracking a conversation that seemed to be really intense and fully engaging, and he was tracking a mongoose with his ears at the same time. Is he, is he amazing? <laughs> but is he? <laughs> Come on. You, are you with me? That's your operating system. Not his, that's not him being amazing. That's your operating system. Are you with me now? That's how primary art of mentoring is. Yes, you can do that. You're designed to do that. And if you just do it, you'll find that you can do it. But you won't just do it. And we know that. Because of all of the habits that have been sort of beaten into us literally, I think, you know, quite literally, <laughs> from way back when, you literally had to beat humans to get them out of those patterns 
that Shkuta was born to have. Are you with me on that now? Okay, so here's how, how cool we are. This is how cool we are. My daughter, Willa, is five now, but when she was three, she was sitting in a hot tub in Portland, Oregon. <clears throat> and she's sitting in the hot tub, and she's got her back to a big cedar tree that has a branch leaning on a roof. And we're in a city, and there's helicopters flying because it's traffic hour, so the traffic helicopters are flying over downtown Portland. Sirens are going off. Cars are going by. Just, you know, from here to where that door is, cars are charging by on a road, and there's a little thin wooden fence there. It's loud, this place. Okay, it's assaulting on your senses. Will is sitting in a hot tub in, early in the morning, up to her chin, and she's got a plastic hamburger <clears throat> that's hollow. It's part of some toy set, I guess some kitchen set that... And she's got it floating in front of her. And she's got this other little thing on top of it, which I think was like a piece of broccoli or something, a plastic broccoli. And she's got a whole world going on about a ship and about a little person. And the broccoli's the person and the hamburger's the ship. And she's going on this whole journey. And I'm sitting in the tub with her, but I'm sitting on this angle so I can see behind her and I can see the roof and I can see the cedar tree, you know. And she's having a whole conversation with her broccoli and her hamburger. <laughs> And the steam is rising around her, and the noise is all over the city. And a junco flies in and lands on the roof right at the gutter. And it goes, and then it flies off. OK? So I wait five minutes. And then I'm saying, I said, Willa, we should go now. Because we had to go somewhere that day. But she's not going to leave her, her ship and her person in this world that she's in. And I, I say, come on, we have to go now. Let's, let's, uh, let's have fun getting out of the tub here. Come on, we got to go. She's like, doesn't, doesn't answer me. She just stares at her little hamburger. And, come on, darling. I don't want to have to yell at you. Let's go. So she continues to ignore me. So I say to her, Willa, if you come quickly, maybe we'll get some ice cream when, we, when we're done walking today. And she goes like this. <laughs> so I know she's hearing everything I'm saying to her, right? And uh, I said, but I will only give you ice cream if you can tell me where the Junko gave its alarm. And she goes, I guess, <laughs> and points exactly at where that Junko gave its alarm. That's what we're designed to do. Now, is she amazing? Yes. But aren't we all? You know what I'm saying? That's you I'm talking about. I'm not talking about Willa or Guto. I'm talking about you. That's your operating system. What happens between Willa's age and adulthood in our world is that we are little by little shuffled away from that potential. And we are just narrowed and narrowed and compressed and disconnected and disconnected and disconnected and disconnected and disconnected until we become these isolated units. And all we have left is the need to believe. You know? So belief systems matter when there's nothing left of your sensory dynamic connection. You, know, you need that stuff because it keeps you sane in an otherwise insane world. How many of you believe the world just might be insane, especially the way it's going? Okay. Don't let go of that. It might just be insane. Humans might just be completely out of control and completely insane. They might. That's really possible. I have evidence to, to support that. <laughs> you would never run the wrong operating system on your hardware. You just wouldn't do it. It just won't work right. You know, you would never do it. An extreme example, you, you get a Macintosh and you try and clear it and put PC software and, and operating system on it. That would be like heresy. People would be like, why did you do that? They would think you were doing it like to make an, a statement or to, or to have some kind of artistic experience, <laughs> right? And people would come and pay to, to actually look at the results in a museum, and they'd all laugh, right? But that's exactly what we're doing. It's exactly how we're living, you know, and we're just doing it without even thinking about it. Yeah. It's exactly right. I mean, that's the whole thing. We don't know that that's happened to us, right? And, you know, it wasn't your parents who did it to you. 
And it wasn't the teachers who did it to you because someone did it to them. You see? And then, so who did it to them? So just keep following that backwards and following it backwards and, and see where it goes. See where it goes. And you'll find always a violent moment where one culture destroys another and then takes it over in this form of slavery and then creates this mess that never heals. And now it's called mainstream. <laughs> and, 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 and if you're with it, you're responsible. That's my favorite thing. Right? And, and everyone's just complicit, totally complicit. It's just got this giant momentum. You know? And I'm so irresponsible and irrational for even saying that to you right now. So forgive me, I'm just kidding. Anyway, <laughs> back to the model. <laughs> back to the model. Are you ready? The model behind the scenes is really just essentially us rebooting the human operating system. You know, we're essentially, you guys get here, we plug a DVD in, it kind of goes in the background, and then all this stuff starts happening. But it's happening from underneath, and it's going like this. So I'm just going to lay out the engineering of the model right now. We've got some work to do. So the archetypes. You know, we were looking for a basket by which we could collect and store and utilize operating system components. And it was too hard to store them. You guys know what Legos are? Do you have Legos here? Okay, so if, um, if you think about each cultural element, part of the operating system as a Lego, and we take a box that a washing machine comes in, Cardboard box. They used to come in cardboard boxes, and my favorite thing was when my parents got a new appliance and we would get the box mm -hmm. as kids, right? So picture the box. Fill it with Legos to the top. From every Lego set you've ever seen, anywhere you've ever been on planet Earth, put Legos in this box until they're full. So it's a complete chaotic mess. And if you got one of those like Star Wars Lego sets where you could make the Millennium Falcon, you know, it's in there, but only half of the parts are in there, so it's all in a box. So if you were a little kid and you really wanted to make the Millennium Falcon, you'd be so frustrated. You'd never be able to do it. So here's this box of Legos. Each Lego has the potential, if I pull it out and give it to you and you use it as a nature connection opportunity, that little tool, to reboot your operating system. That's what we were doing for years. We were collecting cool Legos for human operating system reboot kept throwing it in the Lego box. But what we found out was, when we would go to a new community to teach them, we'd reach in the box. And we would just take the ones in the top all the time. So there was Legos down here that never saw the light of day. And maybe they were really needed, but we couldn't get to them. So we were trying to figure out a way to sort everything. So that the Legos would get used regularly, and the ones that were way down here would come out regularly. Because otherwise you pour them on the floor and there's just a big mountain of Legos and nobody knows what to do with them. That's what this was for. That's why we created it. We needed a way to sort this material. There's no religion behind it. <laughs> you get it? It was like a practical need. We needed some way to organize ourselves. Everybody got that? Mm -hmm. There's no belief system behind it. We needed to organize ourselves. So we thought, Ingwe got really mad with me. And Ingwe's of British ancestry, so you'll appreciate that probably a little bit. He says to me, I had sorted it all and started to list it all in this long list. Uh, Roman numeral one, <laughs> capital letter A, small number one. And I had, you know, like something like 27 categories, you know, 27 Roman numerals, which, by the way, I didn't know how to do that. I had to go look up Roman numerals and try to figure out what to do with this to, to be able to number things. He says, well, show me what you've collected. Show me what you've got. So I brought it all out. In 1984, we're sitting there. We're going through this list. And he looks at me and he says, that's bloody ridiculous, he says. I'm like, why? He said, you're using Roman numerals to sort this stuff. I said, well, what else would I use? Don't use Roman numerals. They're the ones who bloody caused the problem in the first place. <laughs> right? I said, what should I do? He says, let's do what all Native people have always done, including our ancestors. Let's organize according to the four directions instead. Yeah? Cool, wasn't it? That was the primary decision he made that completely altered the future uh, of how we did things. Because he was right. You know, we were using a, divi a divide and conquer method 
that was disunifying, that was actually deliberately gritting out and destroying the intricacy and the magic of how all these pieces work together. And what he said was, unify it. Put it back in a framework which is spherical and multidimensional so that the synergies will just multiply without us even knowing about it. He was sensitive enough to understand that because he was raised among the Akamba people. He was raised as a medicine man among the Akamba people in, in Kenya from 1920 until he left after Kenya declared its independence. He had insights into how this stuff worked. So he simply said, set it up according to the four directions and let it sort itself out. And yes, this is northeast, but it also points up. This is southwest, but it points down. And it's important for you to realize that, because now you're looking at three dimensions, not two. So it's the x, y, and z axis. And we literally decided that that's what we would use it as, the x, y, and z axis. What about the other This one? Yeah. Oh, it doesn't work, because it's, there's no other dimension. So we didn't have it for a long time. So we were, sent, we were only six shields for a long time. On the dimension of time. I know. <laughs> there was a woman in Seattle named Jen Wolf who was a visual artist who kept looking at our diagram and saying that it looked really weird because it was missing something and that we really needed to put that something in there and she said this during an art of mentoring so it could have been here it could have been this group of people just like Alex said what about the dimension of time she was just irritated that there was something missing off of our chart we're like but there's nothing missing Jen because what are you talking about we've got east South, west, north, you could all point to those up and down. Like, there's nothing else to put on there, you know. She's like, but it looks, it looks weird. So finally we said, okay, listen. She came to two or three art of and kept irritating us on this. So we finally, <laughs> we literally just drew the line one day. Dot, a dotted line. Yeah, that's right, it was dotted. It was a different color also. So she says, that's much better. So a woman in the back raises her hand, Pam Hawes. She raises her hand. Yes? She says, what does it mean? <laughs> Literally. She thought that we were hiding the meaning, meaning of it from, from her. I said, I have no idea what it means. I just drew it. You tell me what it means. And that's, that's how this thing grew, from discussions just like this. Right? Teenagers gave us this, told us what the feelings were. You know? And the archetypes were basically, we really wanted it to be as primary as grabbing. We didn't want there to be any deep philosophical stuff behind it. We wanted it to be super primary. So that's what lies behind it. Totally ergonomic, totally primary. So it wasn't until we got to Hawaii that the Hawaiians told us what this other axis was because they had it going in their culture, past, present, future. And all of us in this room are right here at the center. So each of us is at the center of our own intersection of those lines. It just describes where you are. But it also describes where the whole group is. It, just, you, you know, it becomes the organiz organizational principle behind everything we're doing. So now, with the other thing we know is that east is sunrise, and that west is sunset. And for the northern hemisphere, things move in this direction. They move in a sunwise direction. Thankfully, they all my life they have. And, if, if, uh, if that changed suddenly, we would, wind would be the least of our worries, <laughs> right? So we're glad that it's always done that, aren't we? I'm thankful for that. That's a really small thing to be thankful for, but it's really big. It goes like that. Can everyone get behind that? Yes, yes, yes. I think you can imagine what I'm talking about, though, right? Yeah, yeah. The sun rises in the east and it moves to the south, and then after midday it moves to the west. And then it goes down below the horizon, but if you could keep pointing at it, it would be moving to the north. And then in the morning it would be coming from the northeast and then rising in the east. And you know, this time of year, what's really cool about the northern hemisphere this far north is that you can really see the sun rising in the northeast in, in the uh, high summer. And you can see it rising way down in the, in the southeast in, in the midwinter. And you can really see that. So, we also know that summer is ruled by is the south because the light is 
very much in the south that determines what summer is, and the north is, is very much the winter, and there's really no problem with that. If you go far enough north here, you'll hit the land of eternal winter, right? You can kind of get your mind around this stuff. It's really primary, but remember, the equator flips the whole thing upside down. When you go to the other side of the planet, when we teach down in the tip of South Africa, it's very hard to teach this for me, because my brain is so patterned on the northern hemisphere when I go to talk it's very hard to talk about this whole thing going in the opposite direction. But know that it does. When you go down below the lower half of the Earth, the whole thing flips upside down. The sun still rises in the east and sets in the west, but then the wheel turns in the opposite direction. We're not going to deal with that at all. That's as far as we're going on that concept. <laughs> Just know that it works on the other side in a mirror way. So here, it's all about growth externally. Here, it's all about strengthening internally. Build fibers internally to make strong for what? For the seeds, well, yeah, it wants to be tall so it can blow in the wind and the seeds can fly off. What else? What are, what are these plants preparing for? Why are they building strength at this side internally? To fruit. What are, for, they're getting ready for winter. They're getting ready for the hard times ahead. They need to have strength and structure to make it through the tough times ahead. It's internal development, internal strengthening on this part of the wheel. <coughs> internal strengthening. And then over here is the autumn. The first frost is happening in here somewhere. And then comes the winter where everything goes dormant and quiet. But dormant isn't dead, is it? One of my favorite stories is when those botanists took the seeds that they had found inside of the uh, pyramids that were in these clay vessels for thousands of years, and they sprouted at a 30% germination rate. 30 out of 100 seeds were viable after thousands of years. That's the norm. That's cool, isn't it? I love that. It's really cool. And then over here is where the seed gets water and germinates. So the northeast is that point where dormancy can spring back into life. So plants go through this cycle every year, and it's a miniature life and death cycle. Right? Some plants are annuals, which means that they do this whole thing, and then they're gone somewhere in here, and only their seeds make it around. Some plants, like oak trees, perennials, they go through this, and what's happening is that life and death is happening at the ends of their branches. And, you know, new life is being born at the ends of their branches, and they keep growing out from there, right? So in the East, with humans, it, as you find the color, I'll, I'll write it in later, but the East is birth. Um, the East is the sunrise when the head, the head crowns, and it looks a little bit like sunrise. So I'll just stay with green. Okay. So let's call it East is the birth moment. So if you go back from birth, just, just, east, just east of the northeast moment is germination for humans, which uh, I forgot what it's called. Conception. Fertilizes conception. conception, thank you. Conception is happening just east of northeast, thank you. Oh, oh yeah, right on. Beautiful. Okay. So we got birth in the east. We've got conception just east of northeast. And then we've got the time of rapid external growth, which I think you can, you can get behind me on this. If you haven't seen your niece or your nephew in four years, and they were three the last time you see them, you, you're kind of like, whoa, right? Four years goes by. If you've been busy in your life doing the same thing every day, the four years doesn't seem to go by. But when you look at the children, they're just going... <laughs> Right? When do they stop going? Because you can't just keep doing that. Because if you keep growing and growing and growing, you'll be 25 feet tall and you'll just fall over in the wind. When, when does that stop? Help me. When did you stop? You seem like you're still going. I don't know. I don't know. Maybe I am. Maybe 18, 19, 17. So we can just sort of put a range. Adolescence, thank you. So we'll just put it right here, adolescence. So, you know, it, the number is, is going to change, adolescence. The number is going to change from individual to individual, but can we just say it sort of is roughly 18-ish? You okay with that? Yeah. 
Southeast. South, directly south. It's the moment of the solstice when the external growth stops happening. Okay, that's what I'm looking for. That's the correspondence we're looking for. When does the human stop shooting up like a, like a plant in time-lapse photography? Right when they stop. That's that point. And that point is always accompanied by other things, isn't it? <coughs> Adolescence, puberty, physical changes that are also shifting into the internal, and now we move into internal strengthening in the life cycle. So let's just say this is roughly 18, therefore this is zero for a human, then what's this halfway point for the southeast? This is important for you to think about. Yeah, but give me a number. Zero, nine. It's the quintessential nine-year-old. The southeast is such a nine-year-old, it's not even funny. And you'll see that. Coyote's Guide, by the way, is designed, the whole book is designed to meet these numbers with their archetypal value. So if you're running south tools, you're running tools that adolescents really respond to. What happens if you use them on adults? Can you predict something? You'll re-stimulate their adolescence archetype. Their adolescent will come back up again. If there's unfinished business from adolescence, what happens? It will show up. It will be repeated. It will come to the surface because it wants to be dealt with. Because it wasn't dealt with when adolescence happened the first time. Which means if you didn't get the nourishment of, that the nine-year-old needed when they were nine, and you run nine-year-old tools, that nine-year-old will show up really wanting something, really hungry, really longing, really intense. Because the, the amazing thing is, I don't care if you're 50 and you've got five PhDs. If your nine-year-old wasn't attended to, you still need that. And I, that's not my law. That's not my rule. That's just what is. And that's what Art of Mentoring has taught us over 30 years. I can't change that. But what you have to do if you're serving adults is make the nine-year-old stuff seem really adult. You have to roughly meet adults where they're at and let them think that this is very mature and responsible of us and that there's a plan and a pattern and a bunch of things that they can write down and control and have ideas about and discussions. But the whole time you're doing that, what you're trying to do is bring along the nine-year-old and awaken their nine-year-old because if you can get the nine-year-old to wake up, you can feed that nine-year-old and all of a sudden they'll grow spiritually to another level. The whole time, their adult will have this intense trauma going on and all kinds of arguments and frustrations and problems and this is what's wrong with this pro program. And, you, know, you know, all that stuff will come up, right? I guess who bears the brunt of that? Lauren. Lauren. <laughs> Maine. There's a, you know, there's it's, a, it's Mark Morey's fault. There's a, great there's a great gift, right, that comes with re-stimulating unfinished business. So in the southeast... It's the word play, playful, curiosity. And even you can even hear it in Rupert's talk around what it is that breaks a habit. You know, going from unconscious to conscious. So there is a whole adult application to something. It's not relegated to the childhood. Like you open up unfinished business and you put it away. You get this enormous gift into being a vibrant, curious human being, integrated. Otherwise, imagine being an adult without a very active curiosity. What's your life like? I mean, it's, you can imagine that, right? So going back, you're kind of like going back and collecting all the original gems that's part of healthy development. And it, it really changes the possibility of being a human being. Alex, you were sneaking up. Uh, yeah, I, I just... <laughs> <laughs> An observation, maybe a, a thought that just came to my mind was that I think when you take a group of adults and you, you create a learning environment for them where they are doing something which is, like you say, speaking to a childhood type learning mode, that's one approach. But another approach is that if you put adults in the care of children, then <laughs> And, and you create a safe environment for adults to work with nine-year-olds. Yeah. You'll find that they'll 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 need to adapt to that mode of communication, right. but without necessarily having to kind of create it artificially yeah, for themselves. Yeah. Exactly right. Yeah. That's very well. See, that's 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 applying the design. 
you know, that's, that's, good, that's good design application right there, what you just shared with us. You know, you're, you're basically jumping way ahead in the lecture, Alex. I see you one day up here and without a fiddle. And What's that's that? That's why having your own children will bring up stuff. Definitely. Oh, you bet. So right. This is called stacking the deck, by the way. Okay? This is something we use, we leverage at the Art of Mentoring because, and by the way, the Art of Mentoring is, is a total ridiculous pain in the butt and it should never be done, but we do it anyway. Okay? <laughs> like, this is a really dumb thing to do. <laughs> um, for all the reasons you just said. You know? <laughs> But, but we do it anyway because it gives us a chance to dance with something and reflect on it and go like, yeah, right. right? This, we couldn't have this conversation if we didn't try to do something ridiculous. And it teaches us something. Stacking the deck. What does that mean? I'm going to go back to the Kalahari for a moment. Okay? This, is, this might be going too far, so I'll reel me back in if I go too far. It's Sunday in the Kalahari, and we've got a bunch of Bushmen that are with us from the settlements, from the cattle posts, and from the Roy Brock village. And the Roy Brock village has been abandoned because there's no water, and there hasn't been any water um, this year. So they can't live in that place, which is kind of a bummer for them, because there are other choices to live in what amounts to an Indian reservation. Next to pavement, alcoholism, AIDS, violence, people kill you in the middle of the night, you can't lock your doors. It's really it's terrible, you know. So they don't want to be in the settlements. There's a bunch of Bushmen who very intentionally decided not to live in the settlements, and they, re, they re-adopted one of their ancient ancestral semi-permanent villages. Semi-permanent because in the dry season, they used to migrate with the animals north to the Okavango, where the water was coming down from Angola. So they didn't used to have a water issue. But we put in fences because the European cattle industry... They want, they want the meat up here in Europe, and so the whole fence is there for uh, mad cow disease. And it splits the Kalahari in half like a knife, and the bushmen and the animals can't migrate anymore. So there's all this side effect of that. So they have to go live on cattle posts, which basically are like cattle stations, and that's where there's fresh water, so they all come and hang out. So that if you go to where the cows are watering, you'll find all these bushmen families hanging around there, which the farmers don't like. Some farmers like it. The farmer that we work with really likes it. He loves the Bushmen, so he lets them do that. So he's kept them in a little oasis, so the Bushmen are able to keep their Bushmen ways for a little longer. But on Monday, we go out with the Bushmen for the first time in the morning, and there's all these Bushmen, but I'm looking around, you know, and I see that there's three of them missing that I really wanted to see, because I've been seeing them every year. And one of them is Guta, the guy who has the hearing thing that I told you about earlier, right? He's not there. And the old healer, the trance healer, is not there either, Kanama. And his wife is not there, Kanama's wife, whose name I can't pronounce. Because it's got strange clicks in it. I just can't do the click thing. It's really hard. There's 27 clicks, and you won't hear the difference unless you grew up with them. So it's impossible to speak that language if you didn't grow up with it. So here's the situation where on Monday... We all sit together and we start talking to the Bushmen and the people who are with us ask them, how can we help them? Which is really the worst thing you should ever ask those Bushmen. Don't ever ask that question. They're going to answer you. And, and what they're going to talk about is how they're feeling right now. You know, so what the person who's asking the question is asking, what strategic thing can we apply in your community to help your people over the long term? What they're going to talk about is what's bothering them right now. If you ask them, how can I help you? They're not thinking about tomorrow. They're not. So they start getting all grouchy and cranky and talking about this and that. But you know what? The people who are with me don't understand. What they're really saying is that we're thirsty and we're tired and it's hot. And that people are reading all this meaning into it and there's all this discussion going on. And the whole conversation is spiraling down. And the Bushmen are in bad moods. And I'm thinking to myself, oh man, this sucks. Because the people who have come all this way, paid all this money to be here with this experience, are having a downer right now, and the Bushmen are having a downer. So I pulled the farmer aside, and I said, you need to find Guta for me, and you need to find Kanama and his wife, and bring them here. And he says, okay, I'll do that. Because I knew something about those guys. 
from years prior. So they actually sent the vehicle out, and on Tuesday morning, Gutta is there, Hanuma and his wife are there, and some other people are there that I didn't expect and hadn't met yet, so we got more than we bargained for. And all of a sudden, these 20-something Bushmen were now like nearly 30 Bushmen, but we only added four or five Bushmen to the mix. However, we added the right Bushmen to the mix. <coughs> Gutta has got such humor. He is totally all about high humor. Everything is funny. And therefore, the group can never now descend into those kinds of discussions again, and I know that because he'll never let it happen. His, his archetype of the nine-year-old is so strong. He's actually vibrating with this high-level nine-year-old energy. And Hanuma, the same. And he's in his 80s, maybe late 70s. He's vibrating with that same thing. And his wife, the same. She doesn't say very much, but she certainly has that radiance. Because when they were that age, they got what they needed, and they're full. Okay? They're full, <coughs> overflowing. And that's what I'm after. So any way we can get it, Alex, any way we can get it, if it works to bring kids in and to have adults with kids, then that's what we're going to do. But we pay attention. What works is what we do. And you don't know what works until what? Until you try it. And with this group of people, and I don't mean you guys, but I mean whatever group of people you're working with right now, it's going to be different than it was last year. So every time we run an art of mentoring, we run into different things depending on the nature of the array of people's archetypal patterning prior to the experience. We have no control over that. So we show up ready to respond to the best of our ability with as many guttas on the team as we can possibly get. We call that stacking the deck. A very effective art of mentoring has people who are really strong with east, really strong with southeast, really strong with south, and we basically make sure we attract and build a team with the most vibrant version of that archetype we can find in our community. And sometimes we fail miserably and we get 10 people with really strong south. And the no, whole art of mentoring goes south. That, that's never happened. <laughs> Maybe too many northeast. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. All right. So here in the West is when, is, is when we're giving birth, basically. These things are always kind of opposite each other. And so, you know, I like to say, if this is zero, this is 18, you could say this is 36, roughly. But I'm just going to say 40. And, you know, you can think of this as 20. Then this becomes 80. You know, you can say 90 here, but you can also say 100. Because it sort of doesn't matter. You understand that. We're not, we're not splitting hairs and we're not being totally mathematical and it doesn't work exactly this way. We're oversimplifying to get to a certain result. <clears throat> this is meant to be the time when we're in our gift and really shining for our community, the West. Our gift should be out and shining. We should be giving birth to our gift, to ourselves, to our power. Here then, between adolescence, when you have no idea what you're going to do when you grow up, to here when you're shining your gift, halfway in between should be the moment when you quest for your gift. And this is the time when people hitchhike all around the world. This is, this is the couch surfing season. <coughs> and it ends roughly around 28, 29, unless you're Greg Summer, and then it just keeps going. But how old is he now? <laughs> he's rooting here. Huh? We're getting to keep him. Oh, he's rooting here. Good. So you think. <laughs> but he doesn't know where he's rooting. And he won't know until his gift tells him to. And there's nobody who can control that, other than, it seems, the Creator. This is the time when we're the wanderer. Okay, we're wandering, we're searching. It's the quest. I like to think of it as the quest. And, and it's the best way to look at it. It's the 20s. Especially the early 20s. Because that whole Saturn return thing, 28, seems to be some kind of magic number for people. A lot of people go through these massive changes right around that time. And they do this enormous shedding and these giant jumps. Every seven years, every cell in your body is different. Yep. So every seven year cycle, like the 28th year, is the fourth time in which every cell in your body is different from seven years before. Right. So there's a lot of like, like 21 as well. Yep. Like 14. Yep. These are all big moments. Every seven years. So you with me on that? The wandering quest. And it's really literally the time when, you know, you don't want to have a job. You want to be hitchhiking around the country and letting synchronicity rule. How many of you did that in your 20s? You just did that wandering thing. Hey, you're still doing it. All right. 
Um, <laughs> it's, really, it's really a weird thing for parents to expect someone coming out of college to know what they're going to do when they grow up and get serious and lock into a career. That's really twisted. I'm sorry. That's a very bizarre thing to do to our young people. And we create this whole world on, the, on that expectation. I mean, that's one form of insanity right there. It's cruelty, really. But it also comes right back on us because the results, we reap what we sow. I mean, our, our society's insane because we do that kind of stuff to our young people. You know? Okay. Northwest. This is the time when you know you're on your way to becoming the elder. Okay? So here, you're kind of doing the housework. You're doing the look back on the past. This is sort of the ancestral tracking component of the circle. The ancestral tracking. It's a backward look. It's an inward look. It's about processing past energy and trying to come to the present in fullness. <coughs> and then the northeast is the love muffin. <laughs> <laughs> That's California. Reach it. That's California time. <laughs> so, you know, there's a. It's typified by this man who is not. Who is uh, Yes, technical and upright. <laughs> We had this guy named Max Rikus in our community. He was uh, probably 99 when he passed. He was 99 when he passed. And um, when he was 96, he would show up at our gatherings. He'd come to our mentorings, and he'd come in the door. The door would open, and he'd come in about this fast, and he'd, he'd walk all the way through like this, and everyone would have to wait for him to get all the way up here. But when he got up here, he would actually turn to everybody, and, and he would say the most beautiful things to the group. And they were just all of your beliefs and all of your differences and all of your ideas and all of your nonsense would just go away. Because what he would basically say is, look, I'm going to die any moment now. Are you with me? I'm going to die any moment now. This could be my last moment. I may never see you again, and I know it. I fully know that. I so know it that I'm really present right now. And I don't care that you're not present because that's not even my concern. Because I could die tomorrow, so I'm not going to waste my time worrying that you can't show up with me. But in the meantime, anyone who will meet me here in this moment is going to receive the gift of my gratitude for this moment and my love. And that guy could hold your hand like he had a power grip. And he'd look you in the eye and he'd hold your hand and he would talk to you and thank you and honor you and say such beautiful things to you that you would just start crying and you had no control over it. And he would do that to everybody, one by one. And he would just look you in the eye and just make you cry. That's a love muffin. <laughs> okay. do, you, do you have do you have a better term for it I mean as you can see we're not attached if you guys got a better way to describe that I'll be totally fine with it does that work okay. <laughs> so how many of you were stirred just thinking about it yeah right love muffins rule <laughs> and you only need one, you know, for 150 people to blow their mind, you know. So, and, that's, and that's good because <laughs> there's not many left, really, by the time we get into our 90s. The numbers are down a bit, you know. So away we go, and that's the circle of life, essentially, for humans. And, of course, we can see that the love muffin's on his way up to the ancestors in Max's case. Um, and then somewhere conception happens. Something comes down and enters the human. And who knows? Interesting. What's that? Up and down. I think it might just be in my mind. Yes, it's tricky. Because I'll tell you right now, when you split hairs over this and you start making rules around this part of the wheel, you end up with people strapping bombs on themselves and blowing up buses. So I personally don't think we should worry too much about that. <laughs> I think it's really bad for humans to try to define this too rigorously. And when we do... War happens. Murder, prejudice. I mean, all the negative things happen when humans try to control the mystery and try to name it and brand it. You know? And that's what that anthropologist was doing with the Bushmen. He was desperately trying to get them to 
tell him that they had some rule around this part of the wheel. And what they said was, we have no idea what you're talking about. And they're still like that. They still have no idea what you're talking about. Because they just don't do that. Why would you do that? It's like, come on. I'm thirsty. Let's go find water. They don't have time to do that. They don't do that. Primary, we're not designed for that, you guys. No, they, they're very inquisitive about it when the inquisitiveness rises naturally. So at certain times, the conversation gets really interesting. But again, they're not attached even to what they said in the conversation. And, and if you hold them to it as if they said something that they're standing by, you've made a mistake. Because they're not going to stand by that. That's how they're feeling right now. So they're literally like the wind. The wind is blowing, and so they feel blowy. <laughs> the sun is shining, so they feel hot and sunny. You know, And that's just how they are. They don't care about that. When they get into trance state, and the old, the old healer, Hanuma, gets into a trance state, he can heal you from cancer. He can heal you from arthritis. I watched him heal this guy that was for two years. He was limping. He was limping for two He's a walking guy. He makes his living by walking. He was limping, taking painkillers and steroids so his clients wouldn't notice how much pain he was in. But if you looked at his tevas, you could see his feet all swollen, right? And everybody, the doctors tried to heal him. So many people tried to heal him. And this year, Hanuma healed him in two sessions. And what did Hanuma do? He put his hands on him, on his, on his swollen parts, after he reached the trance state. And he cried. Like, I couldn't believe how much grief this guy was throwing through his body. He was like cathartic. <laughs> right? Taking it from this guy's feet. And just crying out all of whatever that was that our friend Alvain was carrying for all the, for God knows where. It could have come from his ancestors for all we know, right? But this guy's pulling it all out into his body and just crying it all out. And then when he was done, now, I just got an email last night from Nicole. She just talked to Alvain. His feet are totally awesome. He's, he continues to lose weight. He feels really good about himself. He's, he's walking up a storm. His feet haven't hurt at all. He hasn't taken his pain medication. He hasn't taken his steroids. You know Alvain. You know, he's on cloud nine. What did that man do? What did Hanuma do? What was that? Hanuma doesn't believe anything. <laughs> Does it matter? He's a love muffin. But he's a love muffin who understands the nature of trauma and how it stays in our body, and he understands how to release it. And I think some of the stuff we do to each other up in the Northeast with religious war and, and prejudice and all this other kind of stuff is trapped trauma that can't be released. And it just sinks and hangs on. And then we name it stuff, and we give careers to it, and then all of a sudden we've got this nightmare. Right? So go take a little pee break, whatever you need, and we'll come back, and then we'll uh, add some more layers. You got the foundation, though? It's pretty good for now. Yeah. Okay, great.